All right, let's get it started. Welcome to John Park's workshop. I'm John Park, and you're here, and I'm gonna do this. There we go. Uh, hey, I'm so excited about today's show. We've got some really cool stuff involving the new Monster Mask eyeballs, and uh, I'm gonna be showing you some texture mapping techniques for uh, creating your own customized eyes, which I'm really, really excited about. So uh, we'll get that going in a second. Let me make sure we don't have an echo. Uh, I'm going to check the chat, in fact. We got an echo. How about now? Now do we have an echo? I'm sorry, I've been changing around my audio setup some more. Um, and we'll see. I didn't actually check how bad the echo was last time on the beginning of that, but we, don't, we want zero echo. So let me know uh, if you suspect we've stomped out the problem. Hey, Mark DeVink. Mark DeVink is over in the YouTube chat. Nice to see you. What have you been up to? Uh, hey, Thomas Veach, Brian Lau, Jacek Radosiewski. I'm sorry, I butchered any. I'm going to stop butchering names. Um, but, uh, oh, good. So we've stomped out the echo. So, all right, let's get it started. I have so much I want to pack into the show. So uh, the first thing I want to mention is a little bit of news. We've got a uh, upcoming newsletter to add to the uh, list of newsletters that you can subscribe to on uh, Adafruit Daily. So go to adafruitdaily.com if you want. And there's a uh, checklists there. Uh, and at the bottom there, you can see we've got Make Code Now. That is one that uh, Mike Barella and PT and I have been working on, and it's going to be monthly for now. Maybe uh, we'll pick up the pace at some point, but you can go and uh, sign up for that. And uh, as usual, we promise no spam or, or awfulness, uh, and you can, you can uh, check out at any time if you don't want to get it. But that's, that's kind of cool. That's exciting. That's coming up. Uh, another little thing I'll mention is the jobs board. If you head on over to jobs.adafruit.com, uh, you'll see some exciting positions that are uh, available, including this one. Is anyone out there a chief operating officer who's interested in uh, becoming the president and chief operating officer of Makey Makey and Joy Labs? Uh, wow, that's something else. Headquartered in Santa Cruz and Cocoa Beach, so it's very, very bi-coastal. Uh, head to jobs.adafruit.com. You'll find that position and many others, and it's entirely free to post jobs or to place your resume up there if you're looking for work. Um, so go check it out. There's some interesting stuff, including that one. Maybe the Makey Makey next president is one of you in our audience today. Uh, let's see, what else? I'm going to whip through this stuff. Uh, oh, Mark DeVink says he's making stuff. That is not a surprise. Uh, do you all know Mark? Mark DeVink. Go check him out. Just Mark, M-A-R-C, DeVink, D-E-V-I-N-C-K. Google that. I don't know what uh, site you're running under. I think Panopticon Labs is the new thing. Um, Mark does cool stuff, so go check it out. All right, uh, so this is your 
Coupon code. If you want to go to the Adafruit store and get cool stuff and you would prefer to pay just a bit less than retail price, then this is going to get you 10% off just in your uh, cart. When you go to check out, you'll type that in. Texture. That is today's coupon code. It is themed. It is themed for the uh, project of the week. Um, all right. Now, I've got a little uh, product of the week since I mentioned coupon codes. What do you want to buy? Well, here's a recommendation I have. It is the DS3501 Digital Potentiometer. Uh, and this is in this new little uh, breakout form factor we've been doing where we've got the Stemma QT slash Quick connectors for I squared C. And you can pass it through and use multiple I squared C connectors in a, in a chain if you give them unique addresses. And uh, this one is really cool. It's like a potentiometer. I've got one right here. It's like one of these here knobs, right? It's like that, except what if you don't want to turn the knob? What if you want a computer program or a microcontroller program to turn the knob for you? It could be reactive. It could be uh, just coded into a pattern. Well, that's what a digi digital potentiometer can do. You can see it's got a uh, low wiper and high, the RLRWRH. Uh, and what I'm using, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little demo I've done, since I like to do a little demo with these uh, products of the week. Um, so let's step over to the workbench real quick. And uh, yeah, let me head over there. I'm going to hide that thing there. Uh, so this is a clock radio that I got yesterday at a thrift store. And as you can see here, let me zoom in a bit. I've added some wires. I'm actually not going to use that one. But this set here, this is tapping into the potentiometer that is right under this little cover here. So there's a potentiometer right there uh, that changes the stations. And uh, you can turn it like that and change stations. You can see it's working right now as I turn that. But when I leave it alone, you'll see it's also changing stations. That's because I've got this digital potentiometer right here, plugged in uh, to an itsy bitsy M0 running a little circuit Python code. And you can see I've added on my own little uh, Stemma QT connector because I like them so much. So that's telling this to run through a few steps of uh, the potentiometer wiper, as it were. It's uh, dividing the voltage. And that in turn changes this. Let me let's turn on the volume here. And so you can see, I can still sort of offset it with the existing knob. You hold the antenna, that helps. Yeah, so there you go. So you can do uh, some John Cage performance art, art uh, type of radio uh, composition there with a bunch of digital potentiometers and radios if you like, or who knows what you want to use it for, but that's what I wanted to use it for, so I have. Um, and so that is uh, the product pick of the week. It's, it's new in the store. Uh, they're inexpensive. I think something like, uh, oh, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show. Um, in the YouTube chat, Mark DeVink just said, uh, uh, what to go check out that he's up to, so I just uh, approved that. Um, I think they're like $5, so go check it out. Here, let's, let's look at it. We've got the little uh, item right here in the store. That is it. It's $4.95, and if you want to buy 49 of them, you are in luck. You cannot get 50 of them because we're going to be out of stock at that point. But uh, I don't know what you want to use it for, but go get it. It's a 10K potentiometer in convenient digital form. Uh, and we've also got a nice guide here. Uh, by Sedacious, Brian Siepert, and it tells you how to set it up, uh, how to hook it up, how to use it in Arduino, how to use it in Python, and how to use it in CircuitPython. So you can run it off of a, uh, uh, like a Raspberry Pi if you want, uh, using the Python setup. All right, so that's my product of the week. Um, all right, so now, let's see. I think it's time to get into uh, this little guy right here. Yes, that's it. That is the, ooh, double vision. It is the make code minute. So let's pop over to, let's see, can I bring that up? All right. So what I want to talk about in the make code minute today 
is how you can create sub strings within a string of external NeoPixels. So what you'll see here is I have a setup where on my start block I'm calling a function called make strip and that creates a strip of NeoPixels that has uh, 24 pixels on pin A1 and so that's what I've got uh, plugged in here on my Circuit Playground Express. Uh, and then when I go to the next function, it says make substrips. And what I'm doing is using this set sub, and I'm calling it sub zero, it's a variable I created, to strip, so that's the original strip I created, from range zero, so it starts at pixel zero, with five pixels in it. So what this is doing is it's treating our single strip like it is four virtual strips. So I've set up four of them and what this does is it makes other things you want to do much, much simpler. So what you'll see uh, is I'll go and light them up. That part's not that interesting. But then look what happens when I, when I hit buttons. I'm actually using this NeoPixel rotate command to rotate through a strip, but instead of going around the whole 24 pixels before it gets back to one, each of those go through their own little sets. So watch this as I press the button A on my Neo on my uh, Circuit Playground Express, you'll see that I'm passing through all five of those pixels and then back to the beginning as if they're four separate strips. I was able to color them separately. You could animate them separately. Uh, it's a really neat trick that allows you to create fairly sophisticated effects with a very minimal amount of code. And so that is how you can turn a single physical strip of NeoPixels into a set of multiple virtual strips of NeoPixels right inside of Make Code. And that is your Make Code Minute. Whoa, thing got out of hand. Uh, yeah, so I thought that was really cool. Um, and you can even set that up to work with the NeoPixels that are built on, on board. Uh, you just have to go through a little bit of um, setting up the onboard NeoPixels on the Circuit Playground Express as if they are an external strip. Um, so there's some code that allows you to specify instead of pin A1, for example, you can choose a variable that's called uh, onboard. So go check that out. If you're doing NeoPixel stuff inside of Make Code, that's a pretty neat trick, I thought. All right, let's set that over there. Um, let's have a swig of some tonic water. Ah, yeah, uh, checking the questions over in the chat, someone asked, um, hey, where is Discord? Why aren't you showing up? Ooh, did I just break something? What have I just broken? That was an innocent enough thing, but uh, I totally just broke the, all right, you're not going to get to see the chat, but I'll say in the chat, someone asked, uh, Deuster asked, okay, uh, is this a 1K or a 10K? Yeah, it's a, it's 10K potentiometer is what it acts like. Um, and then within code, I'm sure you could make adjustments from there. Um, yes, uh, Jatak says it's 10K max, but I think you can define the resistance in code. Um, all right, so now let's take a look at the Make Code Arcade game of the week. So let me bring up that uh, Chrome that I had. There you are. So my Make Code Arcade Game of the Week is Adventures of Bevan Bombus Bumble, an educational experience. Bevan Bombus Bumble, also called Adventures of Bevan. Uh, so let's pop up the uh, the game itself. So this is really cute. This is uh, the Adventures of Bevan Bombus Bumble, an educational experience. Uh, and this is, if you check this out, it's got this really cute graphic style, and, and you'll see why in a second. Um, when I hit A, it says, please press A to start, move with left and right buttons, jump with up or A, double jump by pressing jump again. Yaroa mites are responsible for the death of 80% of American feral honeybee hives. Beat levels to earn more bee facts. So this is a platformer. Uh, and you can see here, I can, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're getting full frame rate that I'm getting, but it's, it's running nice and smooth on my machine. Um, and you can see I've got this adorable bee, and I can power up, and I can jump on top of these uh, Euroa mites to stomp them out. So it's got that traditional platformer mechanic of jump on top of something and you'll hurt it. If you 
get walked into by something, ah, it hurts, and you say, sweet Moses. Um, so let's take a look at the code for this. I'm going to hit stop on here. Um, and I'll show you a couple things that I thought were really nice. First of all, it's adorable. Um, and we'll take a look at, at some of the uh, little graphic elements that were used to, to give it its B theme. Um, let me move this out of the way here. Uh, I wanted to talk about how the mechanic of running into an enemy versus stomping on the head of an enemy is accomplished. And so um, you may think it has something to do with maybe the particular pixels on the sprite, but it's actually simpler than that. Um, and this is a nice way of doing it. If I zoom in here, you can see a little better. This is the um, collision block. So it says on sprite of kind player overlaps other sprite of kind might. The uh, conditional check here is, is the B traveling in a positive direction on Y? And in the make code um, canvas, positive direction on Y means you're heading down. So if the value of the velocity Y of the sprite is positive or greater than one, uh, and it's also not touching the ground, hitting the bottom, uh, then you destroy the, destroy the other type of sprite. If instead you are uh, at zero or negative velocity, meaning you're jumping or you're not moving uh, upward at all or downward, then you'll get uh, the collision which hurts you and, and takes away a life. Um, so I thought that was a really great way to do that type of um, mechanism in the game. And I also wanted to just pull out over here for a second and show you that during the intro, um, when there's text bubbles, let's see, where did it go? There are little frames that you can put around the, um, there it is, is that it? No, oh gosh, let me find it here. There are little graphics that you can customize to create different cursors and to create different, um, frames. There it is. Okay, so during this introduction, the dialogue frame is set to this cute little checkerboard black and white, this B theme. And so any text that occurs in a dialogue is going to occur, in, occur inside of there. And uh, normally when you're in one of these dialogue frames, um, such as this call show instructions functions being used here, there'll be a little um, sort of bouncing animated A button that tells you you should be pressing A. And instead they've uh, adjusted this to be this cute sort of honeycomb style graphic uh, or honey graphic. So that is my pick of the week. It is Adventures of Bevan. Uh, and you can go check it out on the Make Code forum. So forum.makecode.com. And that is the Make Code Arcade Game of the Week. All right. So let's pull that off of there. I've got so many screens. All right, let's dive into it. So the main topic for the show today, the main project, is I want to discuss how you can create custom graphics. Oh, that's two of me. Uh, how you can create custom graphics for the monster mask. So the M4 eyes, um, we have a new guide out on the monster mask. And let me put one on the overhead here about... This is... I think I've got a fairly normal-ish one. And let's let that one boot up. So this one is, let's see, let me get a little better focus for you. There we go, it's fairly clear. So as you can see here, we have a fairly standard sclera, which is the white and veiny and gross part, the back part of the eye here. Um, and then we have this uh, sort of cat eye shaped pupil and iris. Iris is this sort of colored band around the pupil. It's the sort of muscle that pulls in and out to constrict or widen the pupil. Um, and ignoring the fact that this has a, the cat shape to it right now, uh, the things that we're really going to talk about, uh, we'll look at how you can adjust that, because that's actually just a text setting in a, in a configuration file. Um, but we're going to look at how you actually create the graphics that go on those two pieces. Um, so what I thought would be helpful uh, by way of explanation is, let's see, let's pop that out of here, um, to show you in 3D space how 
these are mapped. So there's this notion in computer graphics of objects that are three-dimensional, so in this case our sphere for the eye, and we actually have two sort of partial spheres that are on top of each other uh, to create the iris and the sclera. And then we have a little disc in the center that's the pupil, and we have some uh, a little rim around the back that's non-textured in the case of um, the way the M4Is are set up. So when you look at some object in 3D space, how you get essentially what's a decal or a sticker or paint onto it is actually done in two-dimensional space or texture space. So the, um, the demo I wanted to show you is here in 3D, what I've done is I've taken a uh, two-dimensional mapping and applied it to a three-dimensional object. So here we, you can see we have a three-dimensional uh, eye and I'm going to unwrap in 2D space. So we're flattening it and then we're going to actually unravel uh, what is essentially the texture mapping coordinates or the UV mapping coordinates into rectangles. And so that is actually what the maps look like that get painted and then applied. Um, and so again you can see we have this two-dimensional coordinate system, this texture coordinate system. And this is sometimes called a UV map. So if you think of a two-dimensional uh, graph that's on an X and a Y axis, X and Y are used to describe 3D objects positions in space or 2D objects positions in space. So to avoid confusion in 3D graphics, uh, the, another available set of letters, U and V, that happen to be next to each other are used to imply horizontal and vertical texture space. Um, so this mapping of this UV space or UV texture map would look like this when it gets applied onto the sphere. Okay, and so if you're familiar with things like uh, Cartesian mapping or other globe mappings where you, you take a flat map and wrap it around a globe, there's distortion uh, that occurs by necessity. Uh, in fact, if I look at the um, mappings here of these, you can see that I'm using a sort of non-square set of textures to wrap around this disk uh, in both cases. So part of the challenge in creating your own texture maps is this distortion. Um, and what I want to also show is, um, let's run over to Photoshop real quick. And let me pop that up for you. So here's some example. Um, this is an example that Phil B had put in his excellent guide on the, um, how the technical specifications work here. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this 2D map. Here's a sort of typical um, UV map grid that can be used just to tell where are things starting and stopping. Is something flipped or upside down? Um, so I've used these a lot over the years in, in um, CG models when I'm doing this UV mapping to figure out where an object in 3D space correlates to an object in this texture space. So if we look at uh, this is the iris map and let's see, this is the sclera map. So I've just picked different sections of this map so I can see different colors and different letters. If we go back over to look at that in 3D space, it'll look like this. Uh, let's pop that open and I made some shortcuts here. So I'll switch those. So you can see a little more clearly um, because the pattern is, is more distinctive than the, the sort of repetitions and organic nature of the eye. You can see here, this is how the, uh, the mapping works. So if you want to create, uh, in this case, a marking that's at the top of the sclera, it's going to go at this upper left side of your texture map. And then it's going to, when it gets applied, you can see where that, that wraps around onto space. Uh, and there's some distortion going in on here that I'm not correcting for. It's not exactly the same. I actually don't know what the exact um, pre-distortion is or stacking of, of those spans in the, in the uh, model essentially that's happening on the um, monster mask or the M4Is, but uh, it's actually in this case not terribly important because of the types of texture maps we're going to be placing on it, uh, but it could be depending on, on what you're trying to accomplish. 
Um, it's fairly forgiving though because the texture sizes that we're using are pretty small. So that um, mapping, if I look at that on a real set of the glasses or the monster mask looks like this. So you can see uh, I've just taken those two maps and applied them right onto the existing code that Phil B wrote uh, and we get the iris and the sclera matching up. So I used this as kind of my first step to understanding where, where, where are things? If I want to paint something, where do I have to put them? Um, so now let's look at how this would apply in a couple of cases. First I'll show you a fairly fancy one. So this is, um, let's jump over here. So this is a 3D paint program. You definitely don't need to use this. I'm, I'm going sort of far out of my way to show you the complexities of how some of this stuff works, um, but you can back off and do much more simple things that'll still look great, including um, sort of noisy maps or um, really spare graphic style cartoon eyes types of things. So it doesn't have to be sophisticated to look cool on these eyes, especially because the motion and the pupils and such. Um, so if we jump over to, this is uh, it's called Substance Painter. So if we look in here, uh, what I think is interesting is this gives you a nice um, side by side of what happens when you're painting the 3D map and this 2D space. So let me jump to the iris for a second. And I don't know this, I don't know this paint program well. The paint programs I used to use don't exist anymore, so I just had to, to grab one and grab a trial. Um, so you can see here what I've done is I've gone in with some, this, this program has some really cool brushes that have built-in effects that, that are kind of expecting you're using a real-time game engine, but I've baked that lighting into it, which is cool. So if we, uh, let's go and grab this aluminum brush. Oh, I don't want to just change to it, do I? Let's see. Oh, now we're going to find out how little I know of this program. Okay, there we go. So let's um, make that smaller. So watch my, make sure you can see this, yeah. So watch my uh, sort of UV map over here on the right, the, the distorted version as I paint on this. So I'm going to paint in a little mark here on the side. I'll put paint in a similar one over here. And you can see where those go. And I'm creating a straight line in here for the most part. And yet notice the distortion that occurs over in 2D space. So you can definitely get away, like I said, with just doing things in 2D. But knowing a little bit about how that distortion works, um, how these UVs are sort of packed in tight around the disc and are wider as we go out, will at least help you understand what's happening if you try to paint straight lines in 2D and then you see that they'll, they'll unwrap themselves into these sort of trapezoids into 3D space. Um, so what I did was I took that, uh, that set of maps and I exported those and created, um, like I said, I baked in some lighting. Oh, we're going to need to refocus this because it's a little higher. Hold on. Okay, I've sort of got it focused. It doesn't love it. So you can see here, let's get this one. I've got uh, the lids on on this one, which I didn't on some of the previous ones. And you can see there's some kind of uh, lighting baked into there. So what I mean by baked into it is it's just this is a single diffuse map, a single color map like a decal of a, of a sticker that only has uh, color information and it doesn't have any specularity like shininess or anything like that. But by um, essentially painting that into the, the map or baking it into the map, you get some lighting effects that look cool. It's also darker on the bottom of it. So I've, I've sort of pre-baked some lighting into it so that it, it feels like the light uh, is shining from above into the eye rather than underneath. Um, so you can do some little tricks like that to, to make your lighting uh, enhance the look of the eyes. So these are these sort of weird steampunky looking eyes. So let's now take a look at, uh, hopefully that helps you understand how things um, are laid out. But now let's look at sort of a simpler example, which is just doing things in 2D. So um, we can head back over to Photoshop here and let's look at, let's see if I've got the default maps in here. Who are you? No, no. All right, let me, hold on, let's open some maps. So a really good example is the set that comes with 
the M4 eyes project, which are the, um, the hazel eyes. So I'm going to open up the sclera and the iris BMP files. So here they are. So this is that default one that you saw before. Uh, and Phil talks about the sizes. Again, these aren't very big. This one is, I think, 800 pixels wide by 100 high, uh, and the other is about 512 by 125 or something like that for the, for the iris. Um, and you can see here these, uh, I think Phil, Phil made these. He said that it may have been originated from his, his old roommate's eyes, so hopefully it was a picture he took and nothing grosser than that. Um, but you can see here we have uh, a little dark center, which is probably where this feathers into the pupil. Um, the pupil itself is just a solid color, so we don't actually paint that map. That's just part of how the, how the, uh, the program works, so you can just define a flat color for the pupil. Um, but by, by mixing this in down here, he's going to have a nice uh, sort of remove any edge there. Uh, so this is a map that, uh, if we look back at these uh, cat eyes that I had, that is how the iris is composed. Uh, Let's jump back to that there. I'm going to refocus for you. Let's zoom in a little closer, actually. There we go. OK, so what I'm going to do now is uh, remove that slit in there. So let's take a look at how the config file works. So I'm going to bring up Atom, and I'll bring up a Finder, and let's bring up that. Okay, so you can look at those three at one time. Uh, so inside of Atom, which is just a text editor, if you, let me zoom in here so you can see a little better. If you look here, we have, this is a JSON file, this config.i, uh, and so whenever you want to run one of these, you're going to adjust things in this config.i file. So we have things like the eye radius, uh, which you generally leave alone, the eyelid index, what color the eyelids will be, uh, the pupil color, so remember I said that's usually black, the back color, which is that um, section behind, and then we have the names of the texture maps that we're using. So uh, let's open up the hazel eye example. Real quick. And let's see, this looks, yeah, it looks pretty default. What I'm going to do is I'm going to comment out the lids so we don't see those. And slit pupil radius, let me get rid of that. All right, so I'm going to do is save that file. And then over here in the finder, let's uh, go to that path. Where are you? And... From Hazel, here's this config i. I'm just going to copy that, and then we're going to go to, let me plug in this uh, monster mask over here. And let's see, I think that's mask. Oh, I'm going to unplug the others so I don't get confused about what. I have three of these plugged in for testing. So, uh, OK, looks like your mask three. So what I'll do is paste in this config i just on top of the one that was on there already. And then I'm just going to reset this board. And when it comes back, we should have, if I did everything right. OK, so we've gotten rid of that slit by, change, by hiding that slit pupil radius in there. Um, so now we're sort of at a ground zero. So let's, let's go take a look at this uh, Photoshop example. If I, if I pop open Photoshop, and let's hide some stuff. So over here in Photoshop, uh, I showed you some of these sort of checker ones and example ones. So let's look at the iris example here. And I'm just going to save this off as a bitmap. So again, these are, um, let's see, will you see that screen? Can you see that? No. Uh, it's telling me my size. I'm 512 by 128. And that's good. We don't want it to be a huge file. So I'm going to do a save as as a 24-bit BMP file. And I can save that uh, to disk and drag it, or I can save it directly onto the monster mask. Let's, I'll try that real quick. Uh, let's go. 
bear with me. I'm going to surf around a bit. Um, the nice thing about all this, I mentioned this last night on the show and tell, is that this is pretty direct. We're basically saving out graphic files that we can see and edit directly, these BMP files, and then they run. Whereas in the past, we've often had to convert things to hex tables and header files and things like that. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm going and I'm going to save this as a BMP, Iris BMP, right into the Hazel folder. I'm going to call it iris underscore x BMP, and then what will happen is that's going to save the file onto the, the disk, and then if we go back and look at the finder here, uh, did I minimize it? Are you seeing that? Okay, i got to reconfigure that to find it. One moment. Sorry, I know this is a lot of, of watching me talk about windows that you're not seeing because it's uh, difficult to keep them alive while I close stuff. So let's see if that... All right. Yeah, okay, there's a, there's a window. So let's go into... So mask3 in Hazel, I just saved that file, which is this example, um, iris underscore ex.bmp. And so now what I'll do is go back to my code uh, over in Atom, and I'll specify this different texture map to look for. So you don't have to just overwrite your texture maps. You can, um, you can actually oops, just change the name of what you're, you're pointing at. So in Atom, we'll go here and say instead of Iris, let's look for Iris EX BMP. I'm going to save that there. And then I'll drag it over in the finder from the working directory, which is here. Oh, it was in Hazel. Over to the root directory of the uh, mask itself. So that's going to ask me to replace that, and then I'll hit reset. And then a moment later, we should see we now have that example BMP. So this one's nice, too, because it's got a word, it's got an arrow, it's got an up and a down. I put a colored stripe there. I think Phil had put gray and white, which also works, um, just to tell you what am I looking at. So it's a simpler version of that checkerboard thing. But it can tell you what the orientation is. Now, uh, here's an interesting thing. One of the tricks that... Uh, very cleverly Phil came up with to uh, allow you to use a single texture map without it looking like it's repeating as much is by default both texture maps are rotated 180 degrees from each other so you can see uh, in in some of those other examples where there's these organic eye patterns you don't notice as much when um, you have a, a symmetry going on that's that's the exact same um, texture map being used so by having one rotated that takes that away uh, some of that symmetry. So if we look in uh, Adam again at my config eyes, there are uh, individual settings that you can set for the left eye and the right eye. So if I put in here, I think iris angle, uh, sorry, I gotta put that in quotes, and set that to let's say 0 0.25, so it's 0 to 1 is the, uh, the amount that you can adjust these. So I'll hit save there, and I'll copy that again from the Hazel working directory to the mask itself, hit replace, and then hit restart, and now you should see that instead of the arrow being at the bottom on this left eye, it's going to be clockwise at, at about 1 o'clock. Um, so that's just some of the, I could go on about this all day, um, but that's just some of the uh, things that I think are important to know when you're setting about making your own texture maps. Um, and what I'll do in the guide is I'll go over some of these details as well. It's just a simple example of what if you want to 
copy and paste an image from uh, a photo that you take. You could take a close-up photo of an eye or a texture of some kind or create your own fantastic eye from scratch in a paint program or draw or paint something and scan it or take a picture of it. Um, but you can definitely use graphics that you've created yourself uh, in place of the defaults. And uh, you can go as fancy as painting in 3D like I was showing or you can uh, create things in Photoshop or another paint program like the GIMP that's free and consider some of the pre-distortion, but a lot of it doesn't matter at the end of the day. You can make some really cool things uh, that won't look um, out of place on these eyes uh, because look how cool they are. They're watching you. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's see. I know I blew up my Discord, so I can't show that to you, but I'll take some questions if anyone has them. Um, let's see. What materials do you use? It looks interesting, says Marco Vladimirinka Nina. Um, so the materials are, uh, in some cases, photograph, uh, or originally starting with photographs or paintings based on reality, like these, uh, these veiny looking eyes. Uh, Phil may have started with photos on those. I actually don't know. We, we should ask him. Um, some of them I've just created from scratch and paint programs. Some of them are uh, these little test grids like I showed. Um, let's see. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Toddbot asks, somewhat sarcastically, can you drill through the LCD screens to make holes to see through? No, uh, you cannot. You should not. But you can, I put these onto a set of goggles. Uh, you can definitely wear them on your forehead for, for certain um, effects. If you have the right kind of costume, that might work well, you know, if you're looking through some little um, holes in your costume. Just any kind of eyes, pretty, pretty much humans respond by looking at the, uh, the eyes that are moving around. Uh, or with these, I've noticed I can see under them well enough to walk around. Uh, I don't bump into things because I can see down here, but I can't really see straight ahead except through some of the little uh, drill holes in them. Um, but how do you like that, huh? I walked into the room wearing these and my kids were like, whoa, are those like reacting and looking around? And, and uh, the motion, again, hats off to Phil. This is uh, like Mark Vink said there, it's the, the refresh rate is so good on these and the, the, the animation of the motion is so nice, the blinking when the eyes go to move, it's all really convincing. So, um, And I haven't even put the glass lenses on these or the plastic lenses on these, but uh, with the lenses on top, it, it really also enhances it. So anyway, I hope that that uh, primer on texture mapping is helpful for people who are going to get uh, into creating their own custom graphics for the uh, monster mask. And uh, with that, I'm way over time, so I'm going to get out of here. Um, last little couple bits of business before I go. That is your 10% off coupon code over in the Adafruit store. So if you want to go pick up some cool stuff and get 10% off, just type in texture on the way out and you'll get 10% off. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll leave you with some, uh, some eyeballs to look at. Uh, thank you so much for Adafruit Industries. I'm John Park and this has been John Park's Workshop.